Hey, and welcome to MPHX Church Online. We're so glad to have you checking out our latest message as we continue in Repurposed, From Broken to Belonging. This eight-week series dives into Pastor Noe Garcia's new book, Repurposed. Repurposed and his Romans 8 Bible study is now available in our bookstore or at mphx.org slash repurposed. We hope you enjoy the message. Last week, we started a, a sermon series going through Romans 8. I mean, what we talked about was um, how you see in Genesis 3 that the enemy has always attempted to distort what God has designed. That the enemy has always attempted to distort what God has designed. And, and what we're going to see in Romans 8 is we are left with these broken pieces because of sin, and there's a bunch of brokenness, and Romans 8 is going to show us and teach us how we begin to restore the things that were broken and stolen. And what you see really from Genesis to Revelation is God's redemptive story, his restoration, and repairing and restoring the most broken pieces of our lives. One of those things that we see in Scripture today that we see... Um, is our mind. I want you to think about something when, when in Genesis 3, when Eve sinned, what ended up happening was in Genesis 3, Satan came to her and said, did God really say that? So Satan began to plant stuff in her mind to question and distort God's design. When Eve sat on this thought, her thought pattern and her behaviors and her belief led to her action. So she began to question what God had designed and she acted on the curiosity of what God had designed. And she went outside of God's design because the enemy distorted her mind. And what happened in that moment was then when sin entered... Our minds from this moment on would be forever challenged on how we view God, how we view others, and how we view ourselves. If you don't believe me, in that moment, what happened was she began to hide because now when she was in a relationship with the loving father, this pure relationship, she saw God in his fullness. It was a pure back and forth relationship, her and God, her and Adam, and all of a sudden sin entered through Adam and Eve, and now they are hiding because of their sin. Why are they hiding? Well, why do we hide in the middle of our sin? Because we are afraid of how God views us. So now her sin changed the way she could see her father, but it also changed the way she thought her father viewed her. The lens was now cracked and forever marred. Our minds are pretty powerful. Our minds have the ability to remember uh, many things. Our minds have the ability to create. Our minds have the ability to dream and, and, and have these realities in our head. And we create these, these worlds in our mind. Our minds are very, very powerful things. In fact, a study revealed that the average person has between 12,000 and 60 thousand thoughts a day 60,000 thoughts a day now listen to this you want to know how powerful the mind is 80 percent are negative thoughts out of those 60,000 thoughts for the average person which means in this room the average person constantly dwells on negative thoughts all day long it's like you have this playlist of your greatest hits and your greatest failures that just play over and over and over and over. And that just begins to play over, which is crazy. So 80% of those 60,000 thoughts are negative, and watch this, and 95% are repeated thoughts. This means the average person lives most of their day defeated. Why does this matter? It matters because our minds have the power to make false things seem like reality. Think about that. Our minds have the power to make false things seem like reality. Prime example, 
Studies show that while our minds can do so much, there are, there's one thing that, that really is interesting about our mind is that our minds cannot distinguish from what's true and what's false. For example, a researcher hooked up a professional skier. He did a test to this professional skier and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes, and this test is going to be hooked up to you. And I just want you to imagine yourself going down the mountain, just hitting the slopes, and, and you know, just, just the way you would do it as if you were actually doing it. What this test revealed after several minutes is that the same muscle fibers in his body began to react in his body as if he were actually skiing down the slope. And it began to reveal that our minds are so powerful, they're powerful enough to begin to influence the physical elements of who we are. More practical, um, I have four children, and quite often they will wake up with nightmares, and you can just see it when they come in. Uh, My latest was my uh, eight-year-old. She comes in, looks distraught, her eyes are wide-eyed, like she's been sweating, she's kind of shaky, she looks clammy. We bring her into the bed. What happened? It's 3 in the morning. She says, I had a nightmare. Uh, Daddy, da 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 and, and so I'm like, hey, listen, shh. It was just a dream. In that dream, her mind could not distinguish what was real and what was false, so her body reacted to what it thought was real. Let me bring it a little more personal. Have you ever read a text message, and it was a thum- thumbs up, and you're like, thumbs up? What's that supposed to mean? What you mean, thumbs up? Or you ask your spouse something, they reply, reply with, sure. I'm like, what do you mean, sure? Like, what? like I, I don't know about you, but you can read a text message, and for some weird reason, we put voice inflection, inflection in that text message and just assume the worst about it. You ever done that? Like, oh, no, now they think they're too good to respond in a full sentence, and they just put sure to me? Well, if they don't want to come, they don't have to come. Don't say, sure, just say, I'm not coming. Don't play with me. And your mind just starts to go. And here's what happens. You dwell on this and you set your mind on somebody and you you think every post is about you or geared towards you. You think every comment, you think everything is about you. And you begin to sit there and just you're angry now. You're angry and you can't stand this person. And someone's like, well, did they say that? No, but I'm pretty, I know that they're thinking it. You ever done that or is it just me? <laughs> Two weeks ago, this is a confession, but it just shows how our minds are so weird, or maybe just mine. Um, you know, often I go run into church members or, or some of you I haven't met, and you'll come up to me, and, and, and I don't mind that. I love it. And they'll say, hey, we go to your church, man, yada, yada, and awesome, great to meet you. Sometimes it'll go like, hey, go to your church, awesome. Hey, can I share with you some things that we don't like about it? Right? Kids go for a walk, will be a while, you know. And so you just kind of get used to it. it is what, I'm not complaining, it is what it is. This particular time, um, I was in my humanity and not my divinity, and I was feeling very human. And we were with my kids, and I'm just being trans. This was two weeks ago. I wish I could say it was when I was 18, but it was two weeks ago. And I saw someone keep staring at me, and I'm just like, great. They didn't come tell me where I suck. Right, here they come. And I'm looking, I'm with my kids, and they keep looking. I was like, look around. I was like, I'm going to look one more time to see if they're still staring. Yep, they're still staring. <laughs> and at this point, like, I begin to get in my BC mode. That means before Christ. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if they, they want to come this way, they can come this way. Like, if they want the smoke, they can get the smoke. I mean, what do you want? <laughs> like, you know, this is, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pastor, but I'm protector too. Like, come get it if you want it. Um, so then, like, I'm like, how many back up? He, and then I looked up, and the guy's coming my direction. I was like, all right, here we go. And, and at this point, and I'm just being honest, I start thinking, like, great, they're going to complain about this, that, and that. And I'm just in my not healthy zone. And he comes up, and I'm like, yo, what's up? You know, I kind of get bow up a little bit and get my rag out, wipe out the sweat. And I'm like, he's like, are you Pastor Noe? I'm like, yeah, why, well, who's asking? And, you know, <laughs> And he says, hey, uh, man, I've been watching you, and I just, if it's okay, I, I just want to come approach you. I've been going to your church for six months, and I just love you, man. You're the best. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> like, man, you better come here and give me a hug. Like, but, but I have to admit, my mind was just like, you just, you, 
um, it's like you go through PTSD of what you've experienced and you just get in protective mode and there's a defense mechanism that pops up naturally because my mind told me that I'm used to this, therefore get ready for this. And we can tend to get in unhealthy rhythms and unhealthy habits in our minds. And why does this happen? Well, it's because of the fall. Now all this stuff is in here that we have to battle every single day. 60,000 thoughts a day. And what 80 percent of those are negative thoughts in our mind constantly. What the battle probably looks like in your mind and in my mind is probably this. Um, we are so concerned with what people have to say about us, right? We dwell on what people think about us, what they say about us, and we're just sitting there in this dwelling, not to mention what happens if we fall into sin or we don't do something right, we then to really um, intensify these thoughts. And you think everybody is talking about you. You think everybody's looking at you, right? It's like when I first started going to church, I was deep in sin. When I would walk in, nobody knew me, but I felt like everybody was staring at me. I allowed my mind to tell me that everyone knows that I'm a sinner and they're all staring at you and judging you right now. And I couldn't stay for a full sermon because I felt like I was being so, I was like, Christians are so judgmental. Like, no one even said anything to me. <laughs> and so I would leave. And my mind took me to this place and we get so consumed that what are people thinking about me? And this is probably lifelong because of the fall. This is why it takes people 20 minutes just to post something on social media. Because we got to be sure it's edited right. So we have to edit who we really are to be approved by a bunch of people who don't really care. We have to edit who we are to be approved by a bunch of people who don't really care. And we live in that world, and so there's battle number one, like, who do they say I am? Then there's battle number two, who you tell yourself that you are. And if you're dealing with 80% negative thoughts constantly, it's probably not good. You're telling yourself why you're not good enough, why you're disqualified, why you're a failure, why the, and it just keeps going, right? It's over and over and over. Then let's take these battles of Satan whispering to us false things. We feel like we're not worthy. We feel like we're unlovable. Our sins begin to haunt us and chase us. Other people shame us. And you're sitting here wrestling, just want to explode. Let's also throw in what we have seen a skyrocket rise in of depression. Now you throw in mental illness on top of this battle in our mind that we already have. Now all of a sudden it feels like we are a prisoner to our own minds and we can't escape it. Have you ever been there? You just, your mind just, it doesn't stop. You wake up at three in the morning, it doesn't stop. And you wake up and you're shaming yourself. You're thinking about your failure. You're thinking about your sin. You're thinking about what you have and what you don't want. Thinking about why God hasn't responded to you. Thinking about why you haven't received a text message. Thinking about why the likes on your social media are not enough. Thinking about all this stuff and it's consuming you. And your mind is set on what others think about you and what you are telling yourself that you are. And depression is just a cloud over that, intensifying it. If you want to know why this matters and how powerful it is, I want to share something very sobering to you right now. Did you know that last year, fifth in, in our country, 50,000 people committed suicide? Can, can we just sit there for a second? Because in Genesis 3, Satan distorted all hope that we had in a relationship with the Father. And when Satan distorted that, he had no mercy for us. And now he wants people. He came to kill, steal, and destroy, and he doesn't care. And he wants to get people at their weakest moments. He wants to distort any hope and love that our Father has for us. And so we live in this, God doesn't care, God doesn't want me. And 50,000 people allowed their minds to believe that God doesn't love them and God doesn't want them. And for some reason, they took their own life. If you may sober you up a little more, do you know what that means? It means that every 12 minutes someone is committing suicide in America, which means since we've started this service, there's been a handful of people that have taken their lives. Let's not ever take this gathering for granted. Which also means that Many of you in this room have struggled with suicidal thoughts. Many of you have maybe attempted. Many of you have maybe be here today and like, I don't want to live today. Tell me why I deserve to live. 
tell me where the hope is. In fact, I'll never forget, I'm preaching a sermon, and after I'm done preaching, we do the invitation, and a man comes forward and says, I have to tell you, I came to church, and if God didn't speak to me, if he didn't say something to me, I was gonna, I've already planned my suicide attempt, and I was going to kill myself after church. But God spoke. And I, and, I, and I share this with you because I want you to understand how powerful our minds can be. And let me dig even deeper with you. Man, I have been at the place where I attempted my own suicide at 18. And, and when I asked myself what took me to that place, it's because I, I allowed my thoughts to be saturated with lies. And these lies led to behaviors that were not true. And the lies were that God could never want me. God could never love me. God could never use me. God doesn't see me. God doesn't want to be my father. Nobody will ever love me. I would never do anything good with my life. And I just felt like I was trash. I felt like I was hopeless. I felt like it just didn't matter. And in that moment, I attempted suicide. And my friend found me with a belt around my neck because I was tired of living. And I know that's real and probably too real for some of you. But if you want the gospel to cure you, you have to bring it all out to the light and say, God, here is where I am and here is what I'm feeling, Father. What can you do with this? This is the problem with American Christianity is that a lot of times we don't experience the fullness of God because we come to him with masks on, with a bunch of fakeness versus saying, this is what I feel. This is what I think. God, I don't know what to do with this. And so if you're visiting, you're like, whoa, that went deep. That was a bit much. Yes, because I know that even in the darkest and ugliest place of our souls, that even he is there. That's what I do know about my God. And so in order to free you up, instead of living this fake uh, facade Christianity and not experiencing the fullness of who he is, we have to be okay with saying we're not okay. And God, come into the broken pieces of my life, no matter how ugly, deep, and dark, and broken they are, do what only you can do, Father. And restoration doesn't begin until you admit and acknowledge that you're broken. And my friend, I'm telling you that you're broken, not because I know you. I'm telling you that you're broken because I know what happened at the garden, that when we were all broken and they were all in need of a Savior, and none of us are able to repair what has been taken and broken and stolen from us. There's only one repairman, and his name is Jesus. And he is the greatest doctor, and he is the greatest comforter, and he is the greatest healer. And so the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I believe that if these stats are true and some of you are wrestling with this, what I want to share with you today and the reason why I share about my personal experience, I want to share with you to focus on life, to focus on living and to know that he is not done no matter how dark and deep you may feel and seem right now. If you are still breathing, he still has a plan for your life and it's even more than you can comprehend. It's more than you can fathom up. He wants to dwell in you. He wants to use you. He wants to lavish you with his love and if you are like me and you recognize that life is not easy and it doesn't mean that things are going to be perfect we serve a God who will come deep into your brokenness and meet you right where you are so there's all these battles going on in our minds and some of us have just given up and accepted the lies and The playlist going in your head is constantly telling you why you are this and that, and it's not good and it's not positive. And so we have to ask ourselves as Christians who are really seeking God and trying to figure out who this God is, and we don't want to play church. We want to be the church. How do we do this? Paul writes in Romans 8, when Paul writes... He writes to people who have their minds not set on anything about who God is. You could almost hear in the writing that he is concerned for the people that are living lives without any acknowledgement for who God is because he understands that when you live a life without God, the outcome is never good. Let me just, let me say that one more time for everybody in the room. When you live a life without God, the outcome is never good. And Paul is about to expose that because here's what's true. Our minds will take our feet places we never intended them to go. This is why people have fallen into affairs. This is why people fall into sin. It's not because you want to go there. 
It's because you've dwelled in your mind long enough and it's created this pattern of belief that have led your feet into the action of destruction. I've been there, we've been there. So what's the cure if there is this battle? Well, there's another battle going on in our mind and it's, it's the battle about what does God say about me? What does God have to say about me, someone who's not perfect and he knows everything about me? What does God have to say about you in this seat today? And God knows everything about you. We can fool each other. You cannot fool God. And what blows my mind about this God, I have met people that I've experienced expose myself to, meaning I'm going to let you into my world and, and let you see that as a pastor, I'm not perfect. I don't have it together and I'm still human. What blows my mind is we've all encounter that sometimes when we let people in, they don't like who they see, so they run out. What blows my mind about this God is that when we let him in, but he doesn't run out. <laughs> We let him in, but he doesn't run out. I don't know why we wouldn't want this relationship like that. That brings security, brings stability. Paul's going to tell us how we get that. So here Paul goes. He begins to tell the people during this time. um, And he begins to focus on their minds because he understands the power of the mind. Scripture talks about the mind. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation, protecting the mind. The mind is powerful and God knows it. So he brings attention to the mind. And I want you to see in Scripture, if you're taking Scripture, my little opening talk here can be inspirational, but it's not transformational. I may have sparked you and pulled your ears up to listen to the text, but what I just did maybe inspired you, but it, 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 it's inspirational, but it's not transformational. I'm going to lead you now to the transformational stuff. And that's his word. This is, this is right here. We're about to get in and is the transformational stuff. You want change in your life. I can't do it for you. I can't tell you good enough stories. I can't be. This is right here. This is, this is the change. You ready? For those who live according to the flesh. This word live, just so we're clear, he's speaking to people. This, who are, this is their entire being. He's not talking about the occasional behavior of something. He means this is who you are. This is your being to those who live according to the flesh. According, there is a courtship, a courtship between your lifestyle and the flesh. Now, uh, this is going to be important because there's consequences to what he's about to tell us, and this is going to free you up. It's like he's given us a um, cheat sheet to the test. How many of you have ever had your friends give you the answers to the test before you took it? Just take it. Let's confess. I'm joking. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you are really proud of your cheating skills, my friend. He's like, oh, I cheat all day long. Yeah, that's what I do. Well, well God has given us a cheat sheet, so to speak, to let us see the answer to the test. And he's already given us what happens with the grades if we take this path or this path. You ready? He's like, you want to A, do this. You want to fail, do this. Here we go for the Christians. For those who live according to the flesh, if you want to fail, this is what he's saying. If you want to fail in life, if this sounds very harsh, but it's scripture. If you want things to go wrong, if you want to, you know, what led me to my suicide attempt um, was that I had no regard for God. And I'd done so many things without God that it led me to a really broken place because I was living out of my flesh. It's important that in the scripture, in the Greek, this word flesh, anytime you hear it in the New Testament, walk according to flesh and this stuff, the flesh just means that you are more concerned with the things in this world than you are the things of God. That you are more concerned about pleasing yourself, about getting the right degree, about getting the right title, about making money, about getting more friends and more followers, that you disregard in these areas uh, in your life, that you disregard God, and you're so focused on fulfilling the American dream that you leave God on the sideline. 
So he's talking about flesh. He's meaning the things that you do to fulfill yourself that have nothing to do with God. So he's saying those kinds of people set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those kinds of people are all concerned about themselves and what they can get here on earth. But here's what he's saying. is like no matter how much you get here on earth, it is all temporary. No matter what you get here on earth, it is all temporary. So he's saying you set your mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, this is pneuma. It means breath. It means Holy Spirit. It means the things of God. So you have person number one in group one here, um, person who sets their minds on the flesh. This is just I want to get all that I can out of this life, so I'm going to do what I – it's selfish ambition. I'm going to do what I have to do to get what I want to get. Then you have, that's person number one. He says, but then those, there's a complete contrast. Those who live, this is your entire being, okay? According to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh, watch this. If you're a person here today who is like, look, here's what's tricky. You can be a Christian and use God's name to glorify yourself. And you can fool yourself. And thinking just because you are in church doesn't mean you're fully surrendered to have your mind set on him. That's very dangerous now. Because you can be in church and be, uh, you can be coming to church and doing church things simply to chase what's in his hand, not his heart. And so what, what he's saying here is like, look, a lot of people just chasing what's in God's hand. They just want the gifts. They just want the stuff. They just want the dream. They just want, th- there's that. And there's consequence to that. But then there are those who live, this is your being, according to the spirit who set their minds on the things of the spirit. What does this mean? God, here's what it means very practically. Um, God, what do you want? God, I know there's a promotion on the table, but it doesn't mean it's from you. The American dream may tell me, take the promotion and get more money, but you can see all things and you can see the future. This may lead to really bad things if I take this. This may mean I'm never home. This may mean I become egotistical. This may mean it leads me to an affair. This may mean that I become, you know, this may mean some bad things. What do you want from me? This is thinking of the things of the spirit. God, I'm really lonely, and I got somebody in front of me now that I can date, maybe even marry. I really want this, and my flesh, I want it because I'm tired of being lonely. But what do you want, God? Because I will tell you, not every good opportunity is a God opportunity. Not every good opportunity is a God opportunity because as we know that the enemy will come in a, in a broken dollar store version of God's plan. Do you understand what I'm saying? When Ishmael came, dollar store version of Isaac, bootleg. (laughs) Here's the difference. Typically, when you're chasing the flesh and your own thing, it's filled with you running to something and being self-promoting so that you can get it. When it's the thing of the spirit, it's you being faithful where you're at and God bringing it to you. And let me just tell you, you do not want it no matter how good it looks if it's not from God. So he's telling you here, there is a person of the flesh who is so self-promoting, all about themselves, they're just chasing the dream. And he's saying, be careful, because if you catch it, it's not going to be good. Then there are those who set their minds on the spirit, just saying, God, what do you want? Because I only want what you want. And he says, to set the mind on the flesh is death. Watch this. What's the result? If you're in this room today, and let let me cheat sheet, if you're in this room And you're like, yeah, I come to church, yeah, I sing songs, yeah, the anchor was really cool that he sang, but I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what you said. Listen, I'm just telling you, like, I, I, I can't control that. But what I can do as a pastor and man of God is give you a cheat sheet to what's going to happen. Because scripture says, if you do that, here's the response. That, that, that's, that's the consequence for if we set our minds of the flesh, but to sit on the mind of the spirit, if you say, God, what do you want, man? Here I am. Here is my life. What do you want? You know what that brings? This is crazy. This is not crazy how the enemy does this. Many people are chasing dreams thinking that it brings peace, only to catch those dreams and recognize it brings anything but peace. Then God is telling us if you... Set your mind on the spirit, regardless of what you, what you have, you will have life and peace. So in other words, you can have unfulfilled dreams and still have life and peace, and you can have fulfilled dreams and still have death. 
For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, because it's so focused on fulfilling what they want. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, let me break this down. And I'm going to close here. Because I want this to sit with you. And I'm going to ask the band to come up, and I want this to sit with you. I want this to sit with you. The scripture is very clear, and I'm sure you can break down more in your your small groups, but the scripture is, is very clear that there are two paths in this text. There are two paths in this text. And it's like you want you want to be free. You want to be free, submit to God. You want to be in bondage, keep taking control of your own life. In fact, I I love one of my favorite scriptures in Psalm 32. Listen to this, and I read it last week, but listen. David was dealing with this sin and this stuff. And, and, and if you've ever dealt with sin before, we all have. It makes you feel disgusting and you feel worthless and you feel like a failure. And you're kind of ashamed of yourself, right? You know, if, you've, if you're here today and you, you've ever walked through a divorce, you know, sometimes you just feel like I'm a failure, I'm shameful. In this relationship, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, it's like there was this great divorce that took place. And we were the ones who left. And it's like we just keep feeling so much shame for that. We left and we did our own thing. And I just feel, feel so shameful. And you in your life, I know you do because we're human. You have moments of those times. It's like, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Why did I think that? Why did I see that? Why did I click on that? Why did I do that? And there are moments of that. And some of you have had seasons. And you look back thinking, why did I do that? Now it's on me. Now it's it's my identity. And you start thinking this. David, in Psalm 32... He had an affair, and I'm sure this guilt came on him, and he kept trying to run and cover it. Then he murdered someone to try to cover it up. It's like the sin got worse and worse, and he was spiraling down. It's like, gosh, I don't know how to get out of my sin. Like, what do I do? I'm, I'm stuck. And, and you know what's crazy in Psalm 32 is you're about to hear what he set his mind on. See, it matters. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Psalm 32. I just need you to, to listen. Psalm 32, he's setting his mind on his sin. And he's like, I, I don't even know if God is still here. I don't know if, if you see me. I don't know if you love me. I don't know if you want me. And then he gives us an insight to what's in his heart. And here's what he says. When I kept silent, I want to share with you what happened when, when I was just by myself, isolated in my sin. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And it's just my sin ate me alive. And I just, ah, but I didn't know how to come out of this thing. And he says, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. And here he is. And it's like, ah, I'm horrible. I cannot live. I cannot hear God. The food doesn't taste the same. What is going on? Here I am. I am worthless. I am shameful. My sin is going to follow me. I'm forever this right here. See, he's in his mind telling himself that he is worthless and God doesn't love him. And he's in deep despair now. God, where are you? God, why don't you love me? God, I'm worthless. God, I'm a failure. God, I will never break out of this. God, I will never succeed. God, I will never graduate. God, I will never get a job. I will never have a family. God, I will never be healed. God, it will never stop. And he's so broken. But something happens. Oh, something happens to take this broken soul who felt so worthless and ashamed of his sin to write Psalm 34 when he writes, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Something happened in his mind that he was viewing his 
himself through his, the lens of his failure. Something happened to where it twisted and it changed and he began to view himself through the lens of his father. And when he viewed himself through the lens of his father, it's like the shame was washed away. The sin was still a reality, but he can sing differently and he can say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears I thought he didn't want me I thought he didn't love me I thought he couldn't use me but he answered me he did only answer me he delivered me that I am no longer a slave to my sin I am no longer a slave to my lies I am no longer a slave to my shame that I sought him in my dirtiness and in my sin and he answered me it's like he's saying so please let me tell you those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out from all his trouble. I wonder in this room today if we have any poor people, poor of the soul, poor in sin, who need to look to him and be radiant so that you can see yourself through the lens of your father because of what his son has done on the cross. It's time to set our minds on the cross and what he has done for us. Oh, bless the Lord. His praise shall always be on our lips. Oh, bless the Lord. I sought him and he answered me. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord. Father. you free people up this morning those right now father that in the middle of suicide thoughts suicidal thoughts God in this room please in the name of Jesus give them hope that they may live those who are in the middle of deep sin God or who are walking into sin whether it's an affair or it's whatever it is God please so good to us and no matter how broken and dirty we are that when we set our minds on you we're allowed to see how you view us God and gosh oh nobody can take that away from us in fact when we set our eyes on you man we don't even care what they have to say about me we set our eyes on you, Father. The things that are pure, things that are noble, things that are commendable. On you, Father, you begin to restore everything the enemy stole with the purity of our mindsets. Church, as we sing this song together, I just want you to, where you're at, just confess to God whatever your mind's been set on. If it's not him, will you just ask him to help you? Then there's some of you in here who do not know him as your Lord and Savior. I plead with you to set your mind on him. That's where you'll find life and peace. In fact, in this moment, if you're here today, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. As I read in the scripture, scripture tells us that those who are living according to the flesh will find death. But those who live according to the spirit will find life and peace. And I promise to you, I have found that life and peace, not because I'm perfect, but because my Savior has come and lived a life that I could never live and died a death that I could never die and defeated a grave I could never defeat. And because of him, I'm forgiven. Because of him, I will live forever and eternity. If you are here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you're saying right now I'm on the path of death and destruction but oh I want to change that path we just raise your hand all across this room said I want life I want to change that path all across this room amen amen right here anybody else all across this room students who had a conference this weekend anybody here all across this room said I'm done I want life I want life all across this room I want life 
I want life. I want life. Amen. I see your hand too. I want life. Amen. Right here. Proud of you, brother. Anybody else? I want life. 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 Listen, I'm going to pray. We'll have our pastors up front. And I just want you to sing out to God. If you are here and need prayer, if you are dealing with suicide or suicidal thoughts, please come pray with us. Get some help, please. The altars are open. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, our pastors will be up here right up front. Amory, I want you to get right here just in case someone wants to come down. Father, be with your people today. Give us life. Give us life. Give us life and peace, Father. Give us life, God. Give those today in here life because of who you are. Those who do not know you, I pray that will come running down the aisles saying, I want Jesus. I want life. Give us life. It's in Jesus' name we pray.